So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, thank you for staying late with us, uh, late in a Sunday evening on your, your first day of PCR London Valve. Uh, and thank you for coming to this Medtronic sponsored session. Um, this session is a little bit different. We're not going to be talking about a, a, a particular device or a particular indication, but rather we're going to address some of the structural changes that we may see in our TAVI programs emerging over the next number of years. It's likely that all of us have seen some growth in our TAVI programs over the last couple of years despite COVID, and it's also likely that we're going to see more growth in our TAVI programs as we treat more patients, younger risk, and maybe as we address some of the disparities that we see in treatments across Europe. To do this, we're going to need to become more efficient, we're going to need better teams, and we're going to need to engage with our surgical colleagues to really efficiently be able to treat the number of patients in our units that we're going to need to treat. And so that's what today's program is about. Is about. How can we get better today so that we can treat more patients more efficiently tomorrow? To do this, we have Stefan Wendecker, Ralph Stefan Van Bardlen, and Henrik Tride, who need no introduction to you all. We also have Kerry Penna, who's a TAVI nurse from a very large center in Leeds, uh, and Luc Dumoulin, uh, who is the CEO uh, of San Antonius Hospital in the Netherlands. I'm also, of course, delighted to do this with Madame President-elect. I'm allowed to call you that now, I think. Yeah, yes, Mr. So, uh, President, I don't know if you're Madame or Mister, it's still a long, uh, long story. I'll leave it to you. How can we interact today, Alede? So that's the point. Uh, what, what we are asking you is to interact, because clearly if we have to speak about access to care and how we can help the community to have a better access, access to care to our patient, uh, clearly we need to know which are your thoughts. So this is going to be an interactive session. You can, uh, first of all, there will be a poll. So go on your iPhone or your uh, whatever is your uh, phone and look in the interactivity to the pool. So just, uh, we will do a pool initially and then you will, you are, uh, able, you will be allowed and you can do your question because we have Marco sitting there, Marco Barbanti again, I don't think he needs any special presentation, is one of our most talented interventional cardiologists that we have in our European community. And uh, he will uh, give us the question that you are posing. So again, please interact because that's all the meaning. It's interaction between and sharing experience between all of us. So I think uh, with no further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Windecker with the, the first talk. So. Thank you, uh, Alide. Thank you, uh, Darren. Um, good <laughs> evening to everybody. It's uh, my task uh, to set the stage where we are with TAVI today and hopefully where we can go. And I think all of you agree uh, that TAVI constitutes truly a paradigm shift in the way we approach patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis uh, today. Now, 20 years into TAVI is really an unparalleled success uh, story. And if you see here, which is summarized the evidence that has been accumulated from high quality randomized clinical trials in nine trials with over 9,000 <coughs> patients, we have established in class one a indication for transcatheter aortic valve implantation across the surgical uh, spectrum of uh, risk. Now importantly, or perhaps more importantly, is how we integrate this evidence into every day's clinical practice. And what has emerged is actually to move away from the classical surgical risk assessment, rather to evaluate patients from their clinical status to look at the clinical suitability for one procedure where the other, uh, compared to the other, and also important anatomical uh, conditions where the goal might must be that transcatheotic valve implantation is at least as good as surgical aortic valve replacement if we uh, propose it to any given uh, patient. 
Now, the success of transcatheter aortic valve implantation is summarized on the next uh, few uh, slides. If you look here at the trends in the United States, you see overall that the aortic valve replacement uh, rate increased by 60%. Remarkably, the rate of TAVI increased by nearly 700%, and correspondingly, the rate of surgical aortic valve replacement uh, decreased. What is also interesting to note is that if you look on the screen on the right side, that actually in the United States, already in the age group of 65 to 80 years old, more than 80% of procedures are performed by transcatheter aortic valve implantation. What about Europe? Here you see Germany on the left, France on the right, very similar trends in terms of the embracement of transcatheter aortic valve implantation, where nowadays more than double of the procedures are done by the minimal invasive transcatheter route as compared uh, to surgery. However, if you look at the entire European landscape, then you suddenly note that the top enrollers, that is more than 100 per, 100 per million population, are actually in the majority. And the vast uh, majority of countries still perform transcatheter aortic valve implantation on a much less frequent uh, scale. And if we move then to a global scale, if I could advance to the next slide, maybe, yes. You see that this picture becomes even more grim. These are data, they are dated, they uh, have been evaluated in 2017, but you see that transcatheter aortic valve implantation is frequently performed in the Western Hemisphere, but that there are vast areas around the globe where really there is an, a large uh, area of uh, potential uh, improvement. Can we have the next slide, uh, please? <laughs> So another area where there is disparity is socioeconomic uh, differences. And here you see a map where the density of TAVI procedures is assessed in 25 large metropolitan areas in the United States. And here, the frequency of TAVI was correlated with the income in these various uh, metropolitan areas. And what emerged is that with any decrease in income, as little as 1,000 annual income, there was a decrease in the referral of patients for transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And there were other socioeconomic parameters that actually also indicated that socioeconomic status uh, may disadvantage certain populations uh, to undergo TAVI. Next slide, please. Another fact is despite uh, the evidence we have accumulated uh, in class one indication across a wide spectrum of risk, actually a considerable portion of patients remain untreated. And these are data from two large academic institutions in the United States in North England. And you see here on the left top corner patients with a class one indication in the setting of high grade and severe aortic stenosis, 30% uh, were not referred for aortic valve uh, replacement. Uh, next slide, please. Very similar uh, pictures emerge when you go to the European EOP valvular heart disease survey. Again, 20% of patients that actually have a class 1 indication are not referred for an aortic valve replacement therapy. <coughs> and concerningly, those patients who actually have a class indi 1 indication to be referred for aortic valve replacement have an impaired survival as compared to those that undergo the procedure. Next slide, please. So where do we go in the future? Beside the fact that it has been embraced, but I would say at this point in time insufficiently, I would submit to you that there are two areas in the future where we'll be an increased focus on therapy expansion, and that mainly relates to moderate aortic stenosis and asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. Next slide, please. 
So the first uh, very interesting data set is observational, but comes from an Australian national echocardiographic database in more than 200,000 uh, patients where echocardiographic data were available and where the severity of aortic stenosis was uh, plotted against those uh, that did not have aortic stenosis and patients were followed uh, over uh, several years. And what is easily apparent on this graph is that there was an increased risk of of, uh, mortality on decreased um, uh, life expectancy with increasing degrees of aortic stenosis. Next slide. And this clearly is an indication that uh, uh, aortic stenosis at less than severe grades mm -hmm. constitutes a risk uh, for impaired survival. Next slide. There's an also a very interesting analysis uh, by Philip uh, Genere, actually from the Partner 2 trial, where based on echocardiographic uh, data, the Partner 2 population was categorized according to the extent of uh, cardiac damage. And there were various stages uh, put forward, stage 1 indicating some kind of LV damage, stage 2 uh, in extension to the left atrium, stage 3 in extension to the pulmonary vasculature, and stage four, an extension to the right ventricle. And what is easily apparent on the survival curves on the right side is that there was an increasing uh, risk and uh, decreased survival or increased mortality with increasing stages of myocardial damage. Next slide. Now, what these investigators also did, they followed up that cohort at one year and they assessed whether after the procedure, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, there was an improvement, no change or worsening. And I think what is concerning is that in the improvement was noted only in 20% of patients, whereas no change was observed in 60 and worsening in another 26% of patients. Meaning that in most patients, the procedure probably took place at a stage where it came too late in terms of reversibility in damage. Next slide. And therefore, it is very interesting to look at uh, admittedly small scale, but nevertheless randomized clinical trials, which now used upstream treatment for surgical aortic valve re replacement against more conservative uh, uh, waiting approach in both trials, recovery and avatar were actually uh, positive in terms of life expectancy. Next slide. And now there is a series of studies, which you see on the next slide, uh, conducted in patients with moderate aortic stenosis, as well as in patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, which will provide us uh, with a better understanding in the setting of randomized clinical trials. Next slide. So what, does, what else does the future bring us? Clearly, lifetime management will be an important consideration. I initially showed you data that in the United States, already 80% of patients aged 65 to 80 undergo transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And therefore, repeat procedures, that is TAVI in and previously placed uh, TAVI, will become uh, more frequent. Next slide. And there are in, uh, early data that actually point to the feasibility of this procedure. Here you see in registry comparison of a TAVI in a TAVI prosthesis as compared to TAVI in a pre-existing surgical prosthesis. And you see that in terms of uh, major vascular complications, valve uh, malposition, corneal obstruction, the TAVI in TAVI procedure seems to have a similar outcome as compared to a TAVI in surgery uh, uh, outcome. But obviously this requires very careful planning, and certainly this is only the beginning of an experience uh, we need to build on in the future. Next slide. What we also uh, will uh, be confronted with is an avalanche of uh, the aging population, and with aging, the valvular heart disease prevalence uh, becomes more notable in clinical practice. On the right side, you see estimates as to the development of both diagnosed and undiagnosed uh, valvular heart disease, where from now to uh, 2040, there will be a doubling in the incidence of patients with uh, significant valvular 
cellular heart disease requiring intervention. Next slide. And this obviously begs the question, how do we diagnose these patients? How do we uh, serve these patients? And certainly, artificial intelligence will aid us in identifying patients short of echocardiography. Here is a manuscript uh, showing that actually electrocardiography is able to correctly identify patients that have significant valvular heart disease. And on the next slide, you will also see data that indicate that artificial intelligence is useful for the use of the interpretation of echocardiographic data. If we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, where you see the use of categorization of echocardiographic uh, data in artificial intelligence assisting us in correctly interpreting the severity of valvular heart disease. Next slide. So I'm closing uh, with how we may uh, hopefully address uh, the increasing burden of valvular heart disease to offer patients the optimal way of uh, both uh, diagnosis and uh, treatment. And probably we will need a tiered uh, system where beyond primary uh, care centers that provide uh, the basics of care in terms of valvular heart disease, we need uh, comprehensive uh, valvular heart disease these uh, uh, centers that comprise the entire uh, spectrum of diagnostic and therapeutic uh, um, possibilities, but importantly also assess uh, future uh, innovations both in terms of drug and device uh, development in a responsible way. I'm closing here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So while Stefan comes over, uh, again, uh, a reminder to you that if you open up your apps on the phone and you have questions for Stefan, we can give that directly to him here. Uh, Stefan, a tour de force, and it sounds like we're all going to have to cancel our Christmas holidays and, uh, and just do Tavi 24-7. <laughs> There were some pretty dramatic, uh, some pretty dramatic disparities there, uh, be it geographic, be it socioeconomic. Um, how can we overcome those? Well, I, I think it's really a societal uh, effort. So first of all, what is apparent is uh, that those uh, geographies or countries uh, that allocate a large part of their healthcare budget have a higher penetration of uh, these uh, modern advanced but expensive uh, uh, therapies. And I think uh, here it's important uh, to engage into a discussion with, let's say, governments or countries uh, that have uh, perhaps less privilege uh, uh, economic situations uh, to afford more funding for valvular heart disease uh, interventions. And there I think it's really the competition with other uh, disease manifestations, that is malignancies, but perhaps also the investment in other cardiovascular uh, therapies. And I think the point that needs to be made here is that TAVI is really first a life-saving procedure, uh, is enormously beneficial in terms of improving uh, quality of life and is highly cost effective. So although the upfront treatment is expensive, in the long term, the benefit derived in terms of uh, life expectancy, in terms of quality of life, uh, is, is tremendous. And if you compare this with one, uh, some of the new precision um, uh, medical treatments, be it in the form of cancer treatment, but also newer treatments as they relate to LDL cholesterol uh, lowering, you know, you have one time upfront treatment, but after two or three years, uh, it is already required. Uh, Recuperated. But I think there also industry uh, needs uh, to uh, be uh, innovative in lowering prices. And, and uh, we have this technology since uh, 20 years. And uh, I think uh, to improve further dissemination, certainly I would expect uh, that uh, price uh, will come down because otherwise it's not competitive with surgical aortic valve replacement in, um, in certain geographies. Um, Marta, if I can come to you. Uh one of the other points that Stefan made was, was that we're, we're getting patients too late in their disease process. And, and very often we see in our clinics patients who are too old or too frail to benefit from TAVI. And, and we see the implications of that over the next year or two until their demise. How can, how can general cardiologists and imaging cardiologists help us identify patients earlier for treatment with TAVI or, or indeed surgical aortic valve replacement if appropriate? Well, 
<clears throat> as previously pointed, I think it's a general problem of awareness, first of all. No? So people, you pronounce the word cancer and everybody knows what's that. You say valvular heart disease and aortic stenosis, they don't know about it. And they are not aware that that can kill them. And more importantly, that it can be treated, effectively treated. Uh, so I think the first thing is to increase awareness, and as this involves usually elderly people, uh, increase the awareness that not all shorten of breath is due because you become old. So first thing is increase awareness. Second thing is to use more the stethoscope, particularly for aortic stenosis. is a simple thing to, li to listen to. Maybe other valve diseases are more difficult, but aortic stenosis. And finally, kind of um, build uh, pathways to have referring centers to have a quickly an echocardiography performed. And you don't need very sophisticated echoes. It's, yeah. We can discuss on that also, on the level of echo. <laughs> if we can put up the slide that, that we see in front, I mean, that there are clearly uh, efforts, um, be it locally, be it with, in combination with industry, be it nationally, in terms of trying to identify patients with heart valve disease earlier. Um, this is one of my cardiac surgeons out in a, a local shopping center um, with a local charity, Cree, raising awareness of heart valve disease. And of course, we see the Medtronic bus par parked on Brighton Pier trying to do the same thing. So I think that there are things that we can do locally at a level of our, our national communities to try and, to try and identify disease. Aleda, you, you were involved in, um, uh, in, in Valve for Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that program and, and yes. what the objectives are there? Valve for Life is an initiative from EAPCI, so for, from European Society of Cardiology, our association. And clearly, after Stand for Life, when there was the time that e ideally we had really to treat patients for primary PCI, now there is the need to uh, have more patients accessing the care for aortic stenosis and valve disease. So that's why some years ago it was born Valve for Life. So this is an initiative where we identify which are the countries within the European uh, um, allied countries, the countries uh, into the ESC uh, countries, where we think there is more need, more need uh, uh, in the sense that there should be more work to be done for an higher penetration of this technology into the general population. This is an initiative done at uh, society level, but with the help, I have to say, the support of the companies. So this is a win-win condition because clearly uh, on our side we achieve our result and this is done then together with the national society so this is approachable to the different level of problem because the, the country that normally have been identified are the countries with really very low penetration or disparity in penetration okay. because uh, there are also countries where theoretically the number of TAV is good but indeed there are areas where it's not reached. Okay, and and it, and it may be in in context of a of a sponsored session. Important to say that this this um, uh, initiative doesn't happen without the support of industry not like sure. Medtronic. Equally, Hendrik, I'm going to come to you with a tough question we've just got from the mm -hmm. audience. Why, 20 years later, are TAVI still so expensive? Does it depend on your geography in terms of the price? Is it related to volume? Well, also you have to take or consider, well, taking all the job of the industry, but the, the, the cost of developing this and the cost of all the trials been done are so extensively high that there's kind of reimbursement the companies now have to get back. But finally, when it comes to a longer stage, I think they, the prices will come down okay. and, and they came down with surgical valves too. So I, I think this will happen, but it will maybe take a couple more years. Okay. Maybe, Kerry, as, as you move towards the podium for your talk, um, can, can we launch the poll, please? So if you can pick up your iPhones for us or your smartphones, open up, there should be a poll present there. And the question is very simple. Do you have a TAVI nurse in your center? Um, given the deluge of, 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 of valve disease that we're going to be seeing over the next 10 to 20 years, according to Stefan, um, how are we going to manage these patients as they come through our doors and what systems are we going to need? So um, if we could have the result of that poll, that would be wonderful. Uh, and then Kerry will allow you to, to tell us about, uh, about how you guys have established a great program in Leeds. Thank you, Darren. And I must say congratulations to 74% of the um, participants there. 90% of the job is already done for you, for your patient. 
um, and I hope the rest will stay and, and see whether we could demonstrate to you the benefits and the value that a TAVI nurse can yeah. offer to your service. Yeah. And why a TAVI nurse? If you look at this slide of the patient TAVI journey, you can see that the only task that's missing here is the valve implantation done by the TAVI implanter. The rest of this job is done by a TAVI nurse because a TAVI nurse has got the clinical skills and non-clinical skills to be able to manage this patient along this journey whilst using the, um, the hospital resources that are limited. And one of the vital roles of the nurse is being the main point of contact for the patient. We often manage these patients remotely in the clinic, advocating for the patient and empowering them to manage their condition in whatever setting it is. And if you look at this structure, the, the TAVI nurse, we are uniquely positioned in this unit. We pull all the stakeholders together to make sure that we continue to share that value of giving a safe and effective treatment for our patients. And one of our roles as a TAVI nurse, being in that unique position, is we can see the gaps in the service. And um, what we have done in our, in our um, unit is we have teamed up and partnered with Medtronic to improve the quality of referrals from, from our referring hospitals because we think this needs to be done in the um, correct way at the very outset to ensure that the patient goes through the pr process seamlessly. And we did this a few years ago because we wanted one of the major stakeholders in this process to be kept informed, involved and interested in this process. And as a result, they were inspired to set up their own valve clinics because they think that we could further improve that referral process by doing that. And also, we could improve the communication process in transitioning the care of the patients from referral to back to their care after the treatment. And therefore, we've seen the benefits of that in our local data, as you can see, over a 10-year period. We've seen a growth year on year, but most recently, we've seen not only the good quality referral that we have been getting from these referrers, but that we've also managed to process more referrals and also managed to treat patients in our units, thereby serving our region with the most you know, innovative treatment and that we could offer them to, to gain their quality of life back. But what else can the TAVI nurse do? Well, we become leaders as our roles evolve and a strategic planner. We've seen that our patients have a lot of footprints from one unit to one specialty to another. And therefore, again, a few years ago, um, we have implemented this single point of referral system. And this process is quite simple, but was a very difficult <coughs> task to implement, um, very many challenges um, to begin with, but it was worthwhile the endeavor in the end. So how th does this work? Let's take a look at this case study. We have got a patient here, a 76-year-old lady, who is diagnosed with critical aortic stenosis based from the echo parameters. No major comorbidities. And on papers, this lady looks like she's, um, she's not frail. So a, t a TAVI CT has already been, been performed locally, showing that she has got mild coronary artery disease. Her main symptom is, is NYHA class three breathlessness. No angina and no syncope or presyncope. Now typically, this patient will be referred to perhaps a surgeon, a named surgeon, or maybe a TAVI implanter um, based from the age as per ESC guideline and uh, to surgery because on papers this look like, looks like a, a, a low risk patient. But how will I process this referral? So this referral will go to a single portal electronically where I will access that referral, triage that, and then be able to direct this referral. At this point, 
with our locally agreed criteria for triaging these patients, um, I will not organize a further investigation, but I will get the CT analyzed so that we could see if there's any high risk features such as bicuspid, probably potentially um, you know, big calcification extending to LVOT, which may make a TAVI procedure high risk. But if that is uh, ruled out, then I will progress this patient to be seen in a joint surgical and TAVI clinic, of course, in two different clinics, clinic rooms, where I will also sit there and perhaps I may do a frailty assessment or cognitive assessment to see if there's any doubt from the functional status. I will therefore be able to m do a more detailed assessment. The patient will receive all the information both from the surgery and uh, surgeon and the TAVI implanter. She will go home, study all, all this information. In the meantime, I will process and collect, collate all the information so that this patient will be ready for a heart team discussion and we could arrive at the decision making um, you know, um, expeditiously. At the MDT, um, I will be there advocating for the patient and once a decision is reached, um, for example, this patient who um, is in this gray zone um, has been decided that she could have either uh, surgery or surgical valve replacement or TAVI. I will then communicate that to the patient and if the, the patient is still um, has got some uncertainty, I may bring that patient back to the clinic for a further discussion. If the patient has made the decision, for example, she, she preferred TAVI because um, on further uh, assessment, she's a main carer of a husband who's got dementia, so she would prefer a, a procedure with um, quicker recovery, so she could care for her husband um, quickly. So I will then manage this patient in the waiting list, um, making sure that she knows and aware with, when to contact um, the team if, if symptoms are deteriorating. And once a date is, is, that, uh, is confirmed for this patient, I will bring her back into my pre-assessment clinic to identify any red flags that would further delay the procedure for this patient. And once the procedure is carried out, um, perhaps one of my um, colleagues, TAVI, other TAVI nurses will also be involved in the procedure, sedating the patient or perhaps loading or crimping the valve. But I will also be there to facilitate an early discharge for this patient, especially if she didn't have any complications. And I will provide that safety net so we could achieve a day one post uh, discharge or perhaps within 24 hours, providing that there is a safety net the following day, a contact, telephone <coughs> contact to make sure all is well. And I will see this patient back in my nurse-led um, follow-up clinic to make sure that the patient is back to her baseline and enjoying the quality and the benefits of the intervention. And this is the locally agreed criteria between the surgeons and in, in the TAVI implanter in my unit. I won't, go, I won't go into much detail, but this has allowed me to be able to direct this patient into which pathway, but also I could then um, advise the referrers what investigations that these patients would likely need um, so that it doesn't delay the process. And this has shown a big impact in our service. If you look at these two data, this is local, our local data, but it, it has reduced the number of waiting time from the different stages of the pathway, from referral to the clinic, um, to the cli from clinic to our MDT and ultimately to have their um, treatment. And this is a data from before um, we implemented the process um, and a current data um, of about six months. And overall, you can see that from referral to TAVI, there is a significant and a phenomenal reduction in the number of waiting times, hence providing more treatment to other patients requiring this. Um, from 303 days or 10 months or 50 weeks to now down to 68, um, 68 weeks, which is about, oh, 68 days, sorry, which is about nine weeks. 
So we're nearly in the target of um, obtaining the uh, Vial for Life recommendation for fast track pathway of eight weeks from referral to TAVI. And I'm sure we'll get there. So are you ready to 30% um, who do not have the TAVI nurses? Ready to set up your TAVI nurse service? Well, here's some five steps, some five S's that I would recommend. Hopefully, it will be useful for you. So the first is the strategy. Creating the business case is one of the challenging tasks for a doctor who's not a business person. And I think some hospital may require this. Some, you know, if you, if you can have that discussion and they could see the benefits of having a TAVI nurse um, based from other centers, then you'd be able to secure the funding for, your, um, for the role of a TAVI nurse. And the next step will be to identify who is suitable for this role. Well, I would say try not to limit your um, selection from a cardiac nurse or a cath labs nurse. I think anyone that's got the clinical assessment skills who would be happy to take on this role, you'd be able to hopefully provide some support uh, in order to get this service up and running. And also the skills that we would be required could be acquired by training and education um, through, through peers and industry sponsored uh, teachings. And um, also we, you need to determine what, what structure already exists in the service and who will be managing uh, that TAVI nurse. And finally, once you've got this in place, you'll be able to delegate the tasks that you've already done yourself, including from information technology to the patient support you've already set up from before. And finally, the TAVI nurses that work alongside me making the service go um, day in, day out, and who have been labeled as our patients' lifelines. Thank you. Kerry, thank you. Uh, a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable team effort, it would seem, and really something that has facilitated the expansion of care to many more patients in your region. Luke, you're a hospital administrator. You're the guy who holds the, uh, the, the budget and the purse strings. Um, what information do I need to bring to you if I want to have a, a program that runs like Kerry, to, to be resourced like Kerry's is? Well, I think um, we have, we have to, um, normally we start with the how, but you should start with the why. So the, the information uh, Stefan presented on the uh, changing indications, the growing demand, the demonstrated clinical value, that's, that's, all these are the answers to the why questions. So you start with that. Then you should uh, uh, convince your administrator that you should be generating volume. Not for the volume as such, but I believe that if you, that volume leads to flow, flow leads to better outcomes, to lower costs, and eventually to value. It's all about value. Uh, so start with the why question, uh, the value story, and then get practical, um, build a pathway, that's, that's number one, I think, uh, a pathway from the initial examination, the frailty consult, imaging, all in one day, uh, hard team, etc., until the follow-up. Then make sure that the electronic healthcare record is designed along this pathway so that you get the logistical data, the outcome data to follow up and monitor your patients. Um, I think these, these uh, um, things are very important to make sure that uh, it will be supported eventually. Okay. But one more thing, maybe. Um, you know, what we don't like are these point solutions. Because for every point solution, we get, a, we get another problem. Let me give you one example. Um, if you grow volumes in TAVIs, um, uh, you might uh, lose income on your surgical department. Uh, so make sure that um, initially uh, you do it collectively. Sure. The cardiologist and the thoracic surgeons, they should um, jointly uh, make sure that we can accommodate TAFI growth. A great message and we're going to come to that. Aleda, you have a few questions from the audience that you want yes. to put to us. Uh, so the first I think is from Stefan. Um, what is the standard of penetration that we need to reach in TAVI? Is it 1,000 per million? I mean, can we give a measure of that? Well, that's actually a very good question. And uh, I showed on the slide the penetration above 100 uh, per, per, per million. But I think uh, to answer that question accurately, we need much b uh, better epidemiological uh, data. 
there is a paucity on population-based uh, uh, data at variance, for example, uh, what we have on coronary artery disease as it relates to the true uh, prevalence of uh, uh, valvular heart disease. I also uh, would submit uh, that we don't know much about the genetic uh, causes underlying uh, tricuspid uh, degenerative uh, aortic stenosis, which is certainly multifactorial. But what I try to say is there may be areas where there is a higher uh, prevalence uh, of uh, severe aortic stenosis, and there may be areas uh, where there are some protective uh, um, measures where the life expectancy is uh, not so high. So I, I think one of the reasons that left to the higher prevalence of, of uh, aortic or in general valvular heart disease is the higher life expectancy that is uh, diseases that we see only now where people become octogenarians, nonagenarians, and uh, even older that have not been uh, there before. So it's complex. I couldn't give you a definitive uh, answer, but I think what you have seen here, the penetration in the US and, and in Germany and in France is certainly uh, where it uh, needs to be at least taking in consideration still the considerable undertreatment. Um, maybe one, one uh, other question, Stefan, is that, again, if, if we're going to have all of this disease landed on us, what kind of resources are, are we going to need in terms of hardware? Um, and so two specific questions. First, do we need to have some grown-up conversations with our colleagues who are treating stable coronary artery disease about cath lab time? And two, should we can be considering TAVI in centers that don't have heart surgery departments? Yeah. So first, I, I think the most important is the software, and uh, rather than the hardware, because uh, somehow you get the, the uh, procedures uh, done. I think conceptually, what really needs to happen in the field of cardiovascular disease, and Kerry pointed the, uh, to this, and I think Luke also, we need to establish dedicated valvular heart disease teams in analogy to chest pain units, to heart failure units, and I think Stefan and Hendrik, they have such model and I think this really gives you the entire chain from administration to non-invasive to invasive up to surgery and then in terms of hardware obviously uh, the ideal situation is if you do have access to a hybrid OR I personally think the way to streamline is to have a full day or an, or the entire week just a TAVI procedures in one room sometimes this is not possible you need to mix the procedures but if they are streamlined uh, you really have a much higher throughput on on uh, uh, procedures and um, as it relates to surgical standby, um, the guidelines uh, recommend that TAVI should be performed at surgical sites. My personal opinion is also I uh, would like to have uh, the procedure done at sites where there is a surgery available uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one is uh, if you want to have a heart team concept and if you want to have an accurate indication, you need to have the surgical input. And I think the responsibility on all those doing TAVI is you need not to, to classify a patients according to surgical risk, but you as, as the one performing the procedure, you need to guarantee that the outcome is at least as good as it would be surgery. And there are patients that are not uh, good TAVI candidates. If the risk for annulus rupture, the risk of corneal obstruction, the risk of severe peripheral vascular uh, complications is, is not justifiable, I think you need to think about uh, the alternatives and therefore uh, that is one th reason. The other thing is you rarely have complications um, in less than 1%, but nevertheless it happens. You have wire perforations. If they are left-sided, you need a surgical repair. <coughs> you have an annulus rupture. You sometimes uh, need surgical repair, uh, the same for coronary obstruction. So for all these reasons, I personally think it should be done in a surgical environment. Yeah. So a nice segue into our, our heart team from Mainz. So a win-win-win. So guys, can you tell us how, how, how you've developed your heart team, um, uh, how it functions, and, uh, and, and, and why we should consider adopting a similar mechanism, please. Okay. So yeah, thanks, Darren. Um, well, Stefan and I, we are uh, used to speak on the same podium. We are not used to have a talk together. So um, <laughs> this is something new for us, and we'll see how good our heart team in this respect works. Um, uh, but yeah, we put some, something together. And uh, just from my pers personal perspective, um, I, I moved to Mainz just one and a half years ago. 
And the reason to go there, coming from another very good center, was I wanted to have this hard team. So this was my reason to again change the place and took 10 people uh, with me. And then we started this program. And since then, I've not regretted a single moment. So it's a fantastic cooperation. But it's not only that, you know, it's not about our sentiments, our feelings, also, so, you know, some rational points that we can discuss about. And there's a good, clear need for a proper hard team because also the TAVI landscape and the surgical landscape has changed with the development of TAVI. We're now facing you know, an increase of treatment options. Uh, we're treating younger patients. And this also increases the responsibility of the heart team because we have to take you know, more care about things like not only the survival of the patients that survives the procedure, it's now life expectancy and the lifelong journey of patients. And this gives us uh, a much more uh, responsibility to do. I think I've got one. Oh, this isn't working? OK, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and then we have, of course, excellent clinical outcome. And, and therefore, uh, we have to have decisions that go way beyond uh, the acute outcome of things that uh, must consider the long-term journey of the patient. Absolutely. And if we saw the, the different number in the volume that was just mentioned by Stefan, uh, I think in, in Germany we do 26,000 uh, TAVRs in 83 centers. So this is a volume of 300 per center in mean, uh, while in the U.S. there are 77,000 procedures in 770 centers, which is 100 one third of the volume that we have in Germany. So this is a very, very precise number. And we also have actually valve nurses. We don't call them TAVR nurses, so we have a valve logistic team. We have our own heart valve unit, which just covers valve disease and some heart failure. So these nurses are experienced to have the throughput of 2.6 or three days in the center, which is a little bit longer in Germany due to some uh, situation, but this involves the pre-analysis and the pre-diagnosis. So the heart logistic team already schedules for the first day CT and all the analysis that are missing, and second day is the procedure. And the waiting time in a case with a mean gradient of 80 would be one week or less. So this is an emergency case in our scenario, so we would not have those waiting times of 340 days, never in our experience, not even under COVID. Uh, so this also has to be recognized. The definition of the heart team, I think, is important. And the most important idea for referrals is that we have to start earlier. It is not the cardiologist. It is the primary care physician that has to know about the patient. And most of them are listening to the lung and are not listening to the heart. So artificial intelligence, as mentioned by Stefan, has to come in for the ECG and a digital stethoscope. Because you're not available, even in Germany, you don't get the echocardiograms for everybody, but you have to pre-select. And the definition of the heart team was questioned by Jack. And actually, here I have the main uh, proposers of this, which is Marty Leon, already uh, in 2000, actually. And there was an editorial in Jack in 2013 by the editor-in-chief, who was very critical about uh, the situation, the heart team, and whether we need at all this number of transcatheter procedures in the future. The difference became true, and one European supporter of this idea was Alec Vahanian, who is also on this ESC uh, scheduled event last year. And he was proposing this in the guidelines 2012, 2017, and it became from a should be considered a must have in the 2021 guidelines. So I think it's a major step up. And for the UK, I brought your own recommendations on the heart team from March this year, 2022. And this is from the British uh, Society. And you can see that the impact of this analysis and this logistic team actually came also prevalent here. So and then we can go to the next. So which therapies for which patient? And we already heard that actually Germany and Mainz were awarded this year for two things. Actually, Mainz is becoming the health city because of BioNTech. We're building a new health city situation and also a new hospital for 2.5 billion, uh, or which is uh, Milliarden in German, uh, uh, euros. And also, Mainz has a 13% 
better survival rate for cardiovascular disease than national average, which is always seen if you go into more urban areas than in rural areas. And the Northeast, for instance, in Germany also has a higher mortality. So these were the hard team considerations in this guideline paper actually uh, for TAVR. And you see these different groups that were developed with the new European guidelines. And it's important always to scan actually for both therapies and then to discuss this. And our hard team meets every day and even in between if needed. So there is no waiting time for the heart teams and we'd rather get the patient down in numbers and get the procedures up in numbers. Okay. And the heart team, that's not only the, the two of us. I mean, the heart team, this is a group of people and, uh, and they meet in various constellations, uh, but the, the mindset is all the same. I think this is the most important thing. And then if there's any <coughs> discrepancy, then we come into place and maybe take the final decision. So uh, there are threats also for the heart team because these days now that all these um, uh, therapies have so matured, has to achieve really the best possible long-term results um, and, and to, to achieve some level of excellence. And this is excellence in indication and strategy, but also excellence in procedures. And maybe what's coming even more important now, excellence in post-procedural patient care. That's uh, what we should not forget. It's not uh, coming to an end with placing the TAVI. And we know also from surgical data that there's a clear relationship between the number of procedures you do and the quality of the procedures you do. This is surgical data showing if you do mitral valve repair, um, the more you do per surgeon and per center, the higher your quality is. So this is maybe one reason why we should stick to what we have, like the bigger heart centers having cardiology and cardiac surgery on site doing it, because only those centers can achieve larger numbers and getting more experience with it and then have best outcome. And also coming with it, if, you, uh, you know, if you're an industry partner, if you're a startup, you're developing something new, you take your new stuff to the bigger centers because this is where you know, the quality is, where the knowledge is. So um, in mind, so thanks to Stefan basically, one has to say we have access to basically all the new technology that's coming and that's fantastic because you know, we can test this, we can try this and I think this is in a very safe environment. So our toolbox is a bit larger than the toolbox of a very small rural center and maybe that should stick this way for a certain time until it really has become a very easy, straightforward procedure. Um, what comes with it is uh, patient-centered medicine. So um, as we talked about already uh, today, we have to find you know, the correct position of everything. So we have to start early, detect the disease earlier, we talk about moderate stenosis, we have to survey our patients and then find the right moment for the treatment and then not let loose but follow them up afterwards. And only then we get the full picture and the best quality. And this is extremely important because with an aging population this problem is just increasing from day to day. It's important to decide together. So for the patient, one door is the entry door. And this has not to be different between heart surgery or interventional cardiology. And what you see here is a daily meeting room where we decide on those patients having the analysis. And of course, you need a CT analysis in order to decide whether to go for a TAVR uh, pathway or to go for a SAVR pathway. So a lot of those bicuspic valves, for instance, is not diagnosed prior uh, to their way into the hospital. So we can uh, pre-design whatever we want if we run into younger populations also for the decision making between Sava and Tava, we also will experience more and more and also in Asia more and more bicuspic valve disease which is better treated by heart surgery. On the other hand we also increase the total volume which also means that our volume is rising. We're not suffering from giving any patient to heart surgery. Uh, on the contrary we get a higher total volume which is important because the structure and the strategy is important to the outside and this has the infrastructure that we have a hard valve logistic team which is one nurse one secretary two doctors actually reading the articles and getting all the diagnostic tests done prior to entering the patient in the hospital and also deciding whether he gets an outpatient appointment or directly an inpatient appointment. So if everything is clear beforehand, why should you run through a heart valve unit outpatient clinic? You go directly on the ward, uh, the situation is tested, a CT is done additionally, and the patient is treated. Perhaps next slide. 
So this is also the different scopes of the patient. So there you see the patient in the wheelchair uh, before in the informed consent. And of course, this is done by the logistic team, by the doctors, or by the chief of the department themselves. And then we see the patient one day after, and it's decided whether he goes home after two days, three days, or whether there's a telemetry. And this is on a heart valve unit that allows everybody to be on telemetry and to run around, be totally mobilized, and then you see if there is any sign of an AV block or not, or the left bundle branch block, and if everything is fine for two days, these people go home. And I think it's important also that we speak both to the patients, so or not to everyone, of course. If the pathway is clear for one or the other side, then you, we don't have to go there, both of us. But if there's any unclear situation, we both go there, and then we decide together and to speak to the patient. And we also work together. And just from a surgical perspective, for me, it's highly important. I can only judge on the best therapy if I've done it myself, if I know what I'm talking about. And I was lucky enough to be part of TAVI from 2006 on. So I think I really understand the therapy. I also really understand surgery. And my surgery has become much better since I know TAVI because I now stop implanting two small valves. I now stop implanting valves that are not good targets for future TAF and SAF. And this is knowledge I have from a TAVI experience. So I think it's important that surgeons are part of the team they work better uh, if they work together with cardiologists. And this is a specific setup that we have a heart valve center with a dedicated ward. And you see here patients with lung fibrosis that were declined in many, many centers, and we treated them totally conscious. So there was no sedation, no intubation whatsoever. He was treated on a high flow with four to six liters, and he's doing well immediately after the procedure, having an increase in his cardiac output by about 30%. So the TAVR was only one part of the game. He, of course, remained remains with his lung fibrosis, but he's doing well and much better, and he's now able to be in ambulatory care again. Yeah. And also, this might be the most important slide of it, although it's a bit romantic, maybe, or fancy or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, we trust each other. Um, and this is, if you, if you work so close together, um, Darren is smiling, and with reason. <laughs> but we trust each other. If Stefan takes a decision, I don't really have to go into detail again and check the patient. I just know what he says is right, I trust him, he trusts me, and then this is a mutual agreement we usually achieve. And actually, there's somebody missing, that's Daniel Durer, because this also alludes not to the girl is not there to be treated uh, for degenerative 75-year-old uh, plus disease, but we have also uh, reinitiated uh, a congenital program, including babies, uh, young adults, etc., that is running since one and a half years also in our center now. So this is for the kid with congenital heart disease. So it has to be the scope overall. <laughs> so the um, uh, adult congenital heart disease special Specialists treat also their, their partners. So this advantage now, Henrik, is on you. <laughs> oh, it's on me? I thought it was on you, okay. So yeah, um, I think it's, it's the advantage we have in mind is that we are renowned uh, experts in the field. You get a, you get a <laughs> weaker <laughs> microphone, I can share mine. You have to do it. <laughs> Ralph Stefan, did, did so, you do that okay. on purpose? <laughs> we, 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 we stopped that. So, so I think one-stop shop is the key word here. So it's important for any um, outpatient, outpatient primary care physician to have only one address, to have one email, to have one telephone number where they can go to. And the decision is later in the center, what is the best treatment for this? No primary care doctor wants to take the decision. How to treat this patient, he has to identify that there is a problem, there may be a valve problem, and the rest is on us. Next slide. So we already talked about AI and intelligence-based medicine. I have to say that the European Union also has a new program that it's initiating now. It's called Health for EU, and this will cover actually the screening cost. In many countries, also like Belgium, Spain, Italy, etc., they're all involved. And this program runs with 50 million euros to detect structural heart disease in the future uh, in the diverse settings of the European Union. And that's, I think it's very important to recognize that here here, artificial intelligence, upload possibilities of digital stethoscopes, if you rarely scan a patient, will become important. And we also developed in Minds now some software for this. So I think this is a bright view into the future to actually accelerate the awareness and also the treatment possibilities. And we should not forget that our numbers needed to treat 
for aortic valve disease, stenosis, severe stenosis is for, try to get any oncology treatment with a high awareness into the same range and also medical treatment. So I think it's important to really bring this forward out to the medical community that we can help with a one-time therapy for a longer time. Next slide, please. And this is, of course, not only following guidelines, it's also needing structure and enabling tools. But the software, as Stefan Windecker put it out, is the true point, and we also put it in here. It's the teams, it's the education of the teams, it's the interaction with the referrals, it's the interaction with the patients. And here you have to have the structure. Next slide. So like here perhaps in Hamburg in the Elbphilharmonie or somewhere else, wherever this photo is taken, the best team is the team that works together, otherwise you don't get a good sound. Henrik, this is from the guidelines and it also follows the heart valve centers in the center on the left hand side, but also the heart team decision on the right hand side, I think, and we can come to the summary now. Yeah, well, the summary is that um, we should go on like this uh, further because it, it's just a success system. We are ultra specialized and, and this is also part of the success story. Uh, we use all imaging facilities there. Are. We have augmented patient management, augmented by AI, as you said, that's going to come and going to change the scenario once more. We have high volumes that leads us to best quality possible and um, we follow our patients to achieve best long-term outcomes. And this is then done by unification. This can be academic unification, it can also be financial unification. We're working on that. We don't have a shared budget now, but we will have it in the future. And, and for the hospital there. administration, it's 1,000 valves plus treated in mines in a small town that's a quarter of a million inhabitants, uh, taking part of a 100 kilometer range across the center. So just to have an idea, uh, and I think we're looking good with uh, two to four weeks waiting time and with immediate uh, answer to really severe disease like 130 millimeter peak uh, gradients. Thank you very much for the kind attention. So, so maybe we have just a few minutes for some brief questions. I think the first and most important one is from Dr. Alfadel, who wants to know that do the heart team in minds think that they can beat the Spanish tonight in soccer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least if you've seen that Morocco could beat uh, Belgium, oh, wow. which is to me an even greater surprise. I'm open for all results that may come. Poor up. Luke, poor <laughs> Luke. He nearly fell over when you mentioned two and a half billion for a new hospital, but uh, it's okay, Luke. It's okay. We're nearly finished. He may come over if he wants to, to try <laughs> a different setting we're open you know for um, new human resources Stefan I do have a serious question yeah. for you so in my in my institution I have a great relationship with my heart surgeons we don't fight about cases but they don't come to the cat lab they don't get involved in Tavi they're not like Hendrik where they were involved from day one but we are acknowledging that we're gonna have to treat more patients is it too late to bring our surgeons down to the cath lab? Is it too late for, for us to, to teach them almost like fellows and, and involve them in, in the future of our programs together? I think it has to start early and it has to be a society uh, engagement. So the Society for Heart Surgeons has to engage into minimal invasive techniques and has to engage into team approaches. I think that's the key question. Younger heart surgeons will not be built into any controversial situations with their cardiologists. Young cardiologists will also not be built into a controversy with their heart surgeons. They will work together at these levels. The problem is very often if you divert the situations by economic, uh, by economic plans and if you say, if you don't perform like this, etc., we'll cut down your department or do this and this. This is why the unified uh, financial resources are so important in the hospitals. And the next thing is structure and style, I think. And that's, that's very important. You have to want to work together. And there are many possibilities. We have heart surgeons like Hendrik and some others that come into the room. Others stay a little bit more outside, are more in the logistics. They they stay as third operator, not as first or second operator, but it's on their behalf. They're offered to become more deeply involved. They don't have to. They may if they okay. want. So extending that hand of, of friendship and, exactly. and maybe the olive branch to bring them in. Marta, we, we, we heard from, um, from Stefan about, about the role of AI, and, and certainly in, in my institution and in my region, one of the major difficulties in, is diagnosis, getting the echocardiogram. We just don't have enough echocardiographers and machines. 
is there any way or are, are there any um, uh, programs that have looked at ex getting the echocardiographers out into the community or, or, or of AI to help us in heart valve diagnosis? Um, definitely we need to work on that because of course the echo labs uh, located at the hospitals are not able to do the job, the big job that is coming. So definitely we will need uh, focus echocar echocardiography uh, in the primary care setting, or I guess also artificial intelligence tools like cell phones that hear the heart, whatever. So there's a lot of work to, to do on that. But definitely it's not going to be in the hospital. Okay. Aleda, there are a few final questions in particular for Kerry. Yeah, there were some questions regarding who is going then to coordinate these uh, um, nurse co TAVI coordinator who is going to be a nurse or it's under direct uh, to the physician. So who is going to deal with them? Okay, so who will be managing yeah. the nurses? I think it's um, a superior a, a, a nurse manager, um, we call it matron here in UK, um, who will need to make sure that the TAVI nurse um, has got the competencies um, updated skills necessary to um, carry out the role. Um, <coughs> but physician, I think there will be um, some kind of uh, relationship, but not directly under the physician or the TAVI implanter. I think it has to be under a nurse manager. Oh, it happens for all the nurse. Normally there is a nurse coordinator. Yes. They are not under physician. And then another interesting question, who is going to pay for this? <laughs> Okay. So maybe the administrator, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or because there was a suggestion to ask for support well, to I'm, companies. I'm not so sure whether it's more expensive uh, That's a good than point. the previous situation. I mean, if you focus on the outcomes, if you organize your processes, uh, you get into this flow. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be more expensive than before because you had a lot of waste. You got people that were less uh, dedicated. Um, so no, I don't think it has to be more expensive. Well, I think from, from my experience um, going to some TAVI centers without TAVI nurses, usually it's the TAVI implanter who will do all the admin side of things <coughs> that the secretary or their admin clerk are not qualified to do and therefore they haven't got that time to do this during the, your work, their working time and they do this at the weekend, you know, in the evening. Um, equally, a TAVI fellow who runs the TAVI service in other centers, I think they um, should be... It's great that they could, they understand the pathway for the patients, but I think they should be concentrating and focusing on learning the skills of implanting the valve. Thanks, Kerry. Um, so if I can bring up the final slide deck, please. Um, some final thoughts. Um, so we, we've heard um, that we have continued inequity and disparity in healthcare. That's not unusual. That's, that's the world over. We see um, females, we see ethnic minorities, we see socioeconomic factors and geographic factors. And I think that we're going to need to work together locally with our societies, um, <coughs> with industry to try and level up some of, those, uh, some of those disparities. If we're going to deal with asymptomatic and moderate aortic stenosis, and indeed just dealing with younger patients is, is going to stress many of our services, we're going to have to work together we're going to have to work in teams, and we're going to be have to become much more efficient. We're also going to need to have some investment in terms of um, uh, developing um, uh, teams, systems, TAVI nurses, TAVI coordinators, and maybe even some hardware. But as Luke has said, maybe that ends up not being more expensive. Maybe we reduce the number of patients who DNA, we reduce the number of patients who stay in hospital and reduce complications and ultimately better treat our patients. We've heard from the MINDS team that there's, there's no doubt that working together, be it with allied healthcare physicians, surgeons, and cardiologists together, give the best outcome for our patients. We've heard an, a model from MINDS that may not be reproducible everywhere, but certainly parts of it are. And we've also heard that cardiologists and cardiac surgeons can fall in love together. <laughs> so with that, I wish Spain and Germany the best of luck. I'd like to thank all of the speakers for, for brilliant presentations, Aleide for being with us today, um, Medtronic for sponsoring the session, and I wish you a very enjoyable evening and a, and a brilliant London Valve. So thank you.